The last wilderness, I want to talk about it just a little bit. God's elect are going to be delivered up before the false Messiah at his time. Uh, when that time comes and when it does happen, we don't have anything to worry about because our father is with us. I'm just going to tell you coming out, to the gate, coming out of the gate, I'm going to document to you that when the false Messiah comes, God promises that he takes care of his elect exactly as he did the Israelites coming out of Egypt. How did he take care of them? He fed them. He led them. He had the pillar of fire. He opened the Red Sea. They had everything and time. He promises he's going to do that for you. The reason I'm doing this, a lot of people before war, before combat, and this is a spiritual war, they get a little antsy, okay? And and that's all right. But I don't want you to be afraid to act. I want you to know that uh, you are God's child and he's with you and you don't have anything to fear. And that's why God wanted you to know what happens in the last wilderness of this dispensation of time. To open your Bibles, if you would, to uh, Revelation chapter 12. We're going to start talking about a woman. And this woman is representative of Mother Israel or God's elect in the first earth age. And then she represents Mary in this earth age. And then she represents you as God's elect in these end times. So pick it up if you would with verse 6. In chapter 12, the great book of Revelation, what is it that Revelation means? It means to unveil, to make known. There's no hidden secrets here. God wants you to know and to understand. It reads, and the woman, this is the woman that had the man-child that was taken up to the father, meaning Christ, of course. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. Who prepared it? God did, okay? that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, what is a prophecy that is given in days? That's for God's children. What is a prophecy given in months? That's moons, that's night, it pertains to Satan. So we know that 1,260 days is three and a half years. We know that, well, as our study this morning, we know that doesn't apply anymore, it's been shortened. From to five months and to two, two and a half month periods. So she's well taken care of regardless of what the time is. And in as much as it is given in days, it means God handles it. It has to do with his people. That is to say people that love him. And anyone, I don't care who you are, if you love him and you let him know, he's your father. He's the father of your soul, and uh, he wants you to love him. It just really makes his day. It really pleases him. So naturally, when this woman gets in trouble, if it were to be so, he's he's got it all set. It's all prepared. And what happens immediately after you are given that assurance? Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. We got the Nephilim, the fallen angels, Michael and his angels, and we got war in heaven. And prevail not, Satan prevail not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. It's time, okay? Guess where he's going to be, in, guess where he's going to end up, though? Right here on good old terra firma, okay? He and all of his angels. Verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, you're going to hear every name Satan is called here, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The whole lot. You know, that would frighten a lot of people. They'd say, oh my, 
But Jesus gave you power over all your enemies, and I hope that Satan is your enemy. I hope that all his little angels are your enemy. And in Christ's name, you have power over them. They're afraid of you. You've got, to, you've got to condition yourself and discipline yourself to know that in Christ's name. They're afraid of you. So needless to, to uh, don't get the adrenaline flowing and get on a high of combat and enjoy it too much. Know that God's with you. He's going to take care of you. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. That's to say his anointed one, Christos, the anointed one. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Did you know that? Satan's up there saying, oh, Lord, did you see what she did or did you see what he did? You know, and, and that's one of your elect. Come on. Yeah. He's good at that. And you know something? He doesn't miss a lick. But he's still afraid of you. Because God has anointed you with that power. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. How did they do that? Don't ever forget that. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by declaring it. By having that lamb on your doorpost that the death angel must go over as Passover is the true meaning of it, thereof. And by the word of their testimony, that's what they do. They speak out. They have that testimony when the Holy Spirit speaks through them. And they love not their lives unto the death. Do you know who the death is? <laughs> Satan. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Christ said, I came to this earth to destroy death, which is to say the devil. So you are going to be delivered up before him. Fantastic. That's great. Man, what a champion you can shine for your people. And let that testimony bring many lost souls to Almighty God when they see the faith that he is and where he stands. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens. I mean, we can really have it nice up here now. Why? And ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He's going to try you. He's going to see what you're made of. But you're made of Almighty God. You are made and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you have power and authority over all your enemies. And they had better be afraid of you. That's why you've got to know how to take names and kick dragon. Be sweet about it. But Satan's not your friend, okay? This is what, uh, we, we get into these kicks of, well, that's politically correct. Well, it's morally wrong. If it's morally wrong, I don't, politically correct doesn't mean a hill to me, okay? I could care less about politically correct. If it's morally correct, I'll go with it. But all that is called politically correct is not moral, they try to take it's Satan's way of trying to remove God from your being. And he's your protection. Boy, would he have a field day if he could arrange that. Um, but he knows he's got but a short time. What happens then? 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. He persecuted the... Um, the woman and her offspring that brought forth Christ, the only begotten Son of God, that made that blood available, that was the sacrifice of all sacrifices, giving you that freedom and peace, okay? Uh, he doesn't like her. Well, that her is you, okay? Uh, that's the bride of Christ. Gender has nothing to do with this. And when uh, she, what, what happens then when he tries to persecute her? 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Do you know from Deuteronomy 32 that our, uh, our father is as an eagle to us? Do you know what an eagle does to a young that starts to fall and can't fly learning? Picks them up, carries them. 
and so he does you. But he car- this eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place. Did it say some place? No, it's her place. It's prepared there. God's had it there all the time. It's in his plan. Where she is nourished for a time and times plural and a half time from the face of the serpent, that old dragon, the serpent being the name in which Eve was taken in the garden. He's going to be, this is why Paul would teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, woman, keep your head covered, not with a hat and not with hair, but with Christ. Because the fallen angels are coming back again. It says because of the angels. Because they are coming to do nothing but harm. But they can't harm you. Why? You're disciplined. You're a soldier for God. You know better and you know what's correct. You know what's morally correct. And you're going to do it. But God has this already taken care of. And naturally, that three and a half years, time times plural, that's three and a half, is the time has been shortened that particular time to two and a half months. But it doesn't matter. It still happens exactly that way. Okay. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Flood of lies. The flood's already started. The flood is by a bunch of his little diehards that are kind of uh, running scouts ahead of time saying you got to get God out of your vocabulary what's wrong with you are you ignorant that you believe there's a God you know they there it's it's terrible but you're coming to that time and that's why you must be prepared because God has already taken care of it for you if there's a condition if you believe if you know his word You can't play church. Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. And it's happening right now. And you have to be prepared for that. Verse 16. And the earth helped the woman. What? The wilderness. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. No wonder. She's going to tear him up. Okay. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, that is to say, even to you today, which keep, which do what? Which keep the commandments of God and have what? Have the testimony of Jesus Christ, the truth. Not playing church, but the truth that Christ brought forward about this false one being kicked from heaven to deceive the world, if it's possible. And of course, he's saying, I'm Jesus. I've come to save the world. And a person that is biblically illiterate is going to whore after them. Now, <clears throat> I want to, we're going to go to the Old Testament. And I wanted to share with you that this was planned by our father long ago. And I think I'm going to use an example. Uh, let's, let's go to Exodus chapter 15. I want to show you what God did do in bringing the children out of Israel because I'm going to document that he's going to do the same thing for you. That's why he can say that it's already prepared, it's already set. But I just want to go here just for a few verses to show you how our God takes care of his children, okay? Because the same thing that happened coming out of the wilderness is going to happen to you. If you read about the two witnesses in Revelation 11, about the blood being turned, water being turned to blood, you kind of get some hints about that, okay? That many of the things that happened in Egypt, the witnesses accomplish. God's elect accomplish, okay? So let's just read a few verses here. All I'm doing is showing you what God did. This is a song that Moses and his sister and his brother sang. This is not the song of Moses, but it's kin. Verse 15 of of Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. 
and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. He let the children across, and then, bam, he drowned the whole army of Pharaoh. That's how he took care of them. Do you think Pharaoh had a chance? Do you think Pharaoh actually had a chance to hurt them? No. God takes care of his own. And he's going to take care of you. That's his promise. He's going to take care of the woman that believes and will be the bride of Christ. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. Have you prepared him a habitation in your heart? That's what he wants. He wants to dwell in you. For, um, and I will exalt him. I'll trust him. I'll follow him. Verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. You know, it is wonderful, and you'll have these um, religionists. They will say, brother, you are so wrong. You talk so coarse. God is love. Don't you know that? God is love. And you're supposed to love everybody. Satan, too. You know, I mean, you've got to have some limit somewhere. It just, you know... Naturally, you love those that follow God, that love God. But friend, you better know who your enemy is because he's out there. And, you know, uh, old Jehu, I'm going to tell in a Bible story here and maybe I'm digressing. I don't know. I'll risk it. Jehu was running along in a chariot and who did he reach out? Jonadab the Kenite. He said, hey, good buddy, how you doing? Call right up here in my chariot if you think I'm your good buddy. And Jehu took that Kenite right into his own chariot. I mean, that's like reaching out and getting hold of the devil's hand and saying, welcome aboard. It didn't work for him, okay? But it saved the Kenite. That's all he cared about. Because Jehu was going to kill the whole bunch that went against him. And he want, the Kenite wanted to be real close. So he didn't get killed. You know, lie, 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 and trick, trick, trick. I mean, they will do it, all right? But God takes care of his own, regardless of what. For Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the, into the bottom as a stone. They went down like a rock. What, what did your enemy have a chance there? None. Why? God killed them. Okay. God dispatched them. The right hand, O Lord, thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. That's what I want you to get from that is what did happen. When they came out. Now, as I promised you, I'm going to document where God promises he's going to do the same thing for you. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. You know that Isaiah chapter 11 is where it speaks that certain animals that are carnivores are going to lie down with lambs. And that... Uh, Christ is going to return at the second advent and put everything right. But what I want to do, I want you to go all the way to the 16th verse. We're going to read it and then we're going to back back up to the um, 11th verse. The 16th verse, so you know where we're going and why we came here. Of Isaiah chapter 11. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people. This is at the very end, do you understand? Which shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. It's going to be exactly the same. I'm going to help them that much, okay? So that that's in your mind. Now back up to verse 11. And it shall come to pass... In that day, what day is that? that? That Christ returns, the second advent. That the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left 
from the Assyrian, the Assyrians took us captive, okay, in the beginning. And from Egypt and from Pathros, that's upper Egypt. And from Cush, Africa, and from Elam, and from Sinar, and from Hamath, that's the home of the Kenite, and from the Isles of the Sea. I'm going to gather my children, that's to say those that love me from all over the world, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. In other words, Judah and Israel always separated. One house, the house of Israel, the house of Judah. He said, I'm going to bring them back together. Okay. So that lets you know what time we're talking about. Okay. I emphasize. 13. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversities of Judah uh, uh, shall uh, be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. In other words, all the tribes are going to get along. They're going to be together again, one stick, okay, join. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them on the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab. You know, that's Rush, Russia. And Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them, shall be obedient to God is how it really should be translated, okay. Why? They're either obedient to God or they won't be very long, okay? Time of teaching. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, the Suez, and with his mighty wind, Ruach, the spirit, shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. That's to say with shoes on. Going to be fine. I'm going to take care of them. And... There shall he be there shall be a highway and highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Exactly the same. He's going to do it for you. I'm going to read a few verses of the next chapters. And in that day, meaning the same time, the same time that Christ returns. And he's gathering his children from the wilderness. And, at, and in that day, thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. God wants to do that. You know, when you feel that Holy Spirit and the warmth of it, he is comforting you. Why? He's telling you he loves you. When he blesses your family, he's loving you. Behold, uh, the, behold, God is my salvation. Hey, friend, there is no other. Okay? Satan will toy with you a while, but he won't save you. All right? I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Yahweh is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Again, there's no other. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And that water runs deep. And that water is eternal. Once you thirst, you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. He's with you. He'll never disappoint you. He will never let you down. Now, there are some that will say, well, life is just tough. So what is just right for God's elect? Hey, bring it on. Let me show you how a champion of God's people works, all right? We can handle it. It's no problem. Why? God is with us. You can go through the Valley of Achor. It's trouble, but you're going through. You're going to make it. And you know it coming out the gate. There's never a doubt, never a hesitation. You're a champion when you are disciplined. In the word of God, whereby you have the faith to stand for something or be good for nothing. Okay. Verse 4. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Five, sing, his, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. He does it. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Did you get that? 
in the midst of thee. Is he? Or is he a stranger to you? Have you declared that and performed that habitation? Do you allow him in? You know, many people come with some that where they're inhabiting something other than Jesus. Okay. They won't help because they've given somebody else a home and it's destroying them. So make sure that doesn't happen to you. Hey, Satan's real, friends. He loves to especially get God's elect, whisper in their ear, and lead them astray. He just really loves it. I've got to, I want you to learn a, a Hebrew word, not Greek, this is Hebrew, as we're here in the Old Testament. And the word is midbar, okay, midbar. And what it means, it means wilderness. But it comes from a prime, and it has another meaning that would be very difficult for some people to understand. Because it is a wilderness, all right, and she's there. She's in the wilderness. But it means speech. Okay? Isn't that unusual? It's very unusual. But it does. It means, it, as well as the wilderness, which means pasture, okay, food, but it means speech. Why? Because she's going to be fed and she is going to talk. You just ask a woman. <laughs> yeah, it's going to, you, you tell them. Hey, but I find that midbar is an interesting word, wilderness in the Hebrew tongue, that its prime comes from talk. Okay. To talk what? Talk God. Talk truth. And in that wilderness that he's prepared, it's a place of safety for you. Where you can speak out against Satan and he can't stand it. Drives him crazy and that's good. Okay? And that's why one of the reasons why when somebody says, for you, Oh, God just never does anything for me. Well, no wonder. <laughs> No wonder, you know. I mean, can you blame him? Well, let me have an hour and I'll tell you my troubles. Don't want to hear it. I'm doing God's work, I don't have an hour. Okay. So don't ever let Satan get you on pity parties because you're a child of God. You're part of that woman. Do you know where I'm going to take you now or very soon? God's going to say, I'm going to allure her. That's like saying, I'm going to woo her into that wilderness. And I'm going to prepare her and protect her. And she's going to do my work. See, hey, Jesus is going to stay on that throne of God until all of his enemies are made his footstool. You're going to be busy? You bet you are. You're the one that's going to put them there. And we can do it. We can cut it. Okay. Why? With his power. No problem. So here we have this um, wilderness, which at the same time, it means pasture. Which Do you know what a pastor is supposed to do? He's supposed to tend the pasture. He's supposed to feed you from it. Where the, you have uh, stability, energy, faith, and a closer walk with God. But at the same time, this particular pasture teaches you to talk and to talk God's way. Why? You're not even to premeditate what you'll say before you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan as it is written in Mark chapter 13. But here this wilderness documents that, brings it home and you can do it. Why? Because you love him. And not only do you love him, but you love our people. And it irritates you that they're being misled. It irritates you when you see little children when, when they try to have their Pledge of Allegiance taken away from them. It just grinds right to the heart. Why? Because you have compassion. It means you're one of God's elect. And that's why God loves you. That's why he can use you. Okay, let's go, with, um, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20.
And let's pick it up. If we're going to pick it up along about verse 33. This will be the Lord God again talking about taking you into that wilderness when Satan comes against you and that you have nothing to worry about. Verse 33 of uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 reads, As I live, saith the Lord God, swearing by himself, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. So you want to kind of put that in your mind and know who's boss? Because he is, and that's good. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. I'm, I'm going to set things straight, okay? And that day is going to happen. He's not going to prolong that much longer. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. That's where the woman goes, okay? And there will I plead with you face to face. In other words, you're going to be fed and you're going to speak. Face to face, mouth to mouth. Do not premeditate what you'll say, but speak that that he gives you at that moment. And as it is written in Luke 21, even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say. Why? It's God speaking. He's guiding you. That's why you're a winner. That's why God loves you so very much. Verse 36, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. It's a guarantee. Just as he brought the children of of, uh, Israel, those that loved him out of the land of Egypt, freed them with a mighty hand. We're talking supernatural here, beloved. We're talking about being delivered at the second coming when Christ returns. We're talking about God's children as they take this message to the world. Okay. You're going to do it. God's, those that love God are going to do it. And it's his promise that he will lead you, he will protect you, just as he did them. And they, were, they had the victory all the way. He fed the manna from heaven. That's what's in his pasture in the wilderness, his manna. It's that white stone mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, with manna, truth, God's word. And he, just as he protected them, it is his promise. This woman that goes into the wilderness, I will lead her there. And that woman is to be the bride of Christ. That woman is to be those that love the Lord Jesus Christ and those that follow him. Those that love him and those that serve him, do you? And that's, have you, do you have that habitation, that place for him? Then that's why he loves you. He cares. And do you know something? Do you understand what he's telling us here? I guarantee you the victory. I just guarantee it. Write it down. Believe it. Because it's true. And just as he brought them out, so does he take care of this woman in the wilderness. This medbar, which is to say speech and food, truth, God's word. You know, you can do a lot with God's word when you absorb it, when you digest his truth and follow and you know his guarantees. And then he continues on. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Do you know what the rod is? It's a shepherd's staff, okay? And each night when a shepherd comes in, when he puts his sheep away in the sheep cot, they pass under, he tells them, a teller. You know, like at a bank, a teller, only he's telling sheep. They pass under that rod, are you mine? Whoop, 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 let's cull this one out, Okay? In other words, some are not going to make it. He only takes the real thing. He only takes one that belongs in his pasture. And then he takes care of it. But he does count. Do you understand? And that's, that's fair. Okay. Because you know why? Too long do we let the enemy jump right in the sack with us. Okay. Right in our secret planning. Okay. 
You take even in church planning, do you realize that uh, they're there? They try to be, and that's fine. I like to convert them, okay? <laughs> Woo! That's, that's a challenge, okay, you know? A real good Christian can be converted pretty easy, but boy, when you got one of the enemy, I like to twist his tail good, <laughs> you know? Make a believer out of him. Don't Never be afraid, okay? We've got the victory. All right. Um, 38, I will, when they pass under his staff, you know, you know that little staff has a crook on one end of it? Boy, he can reach out there and whoosh, zap. That was gone, okay? Watch the heart. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God. And he, then he goes on to say, if you want to serve idols and if you want to serve something else, bye, have a good trip, okay? It's your choice, okay? You can love God and follow him and have a guarantee that he will always be there for you fighting the devil when he's cast out and his angels. Or you can go the other way, party with them if you like, Okay? But I'll tell you, it won't be a pleasant trip. Why would anyone want to lose their credentials of passing under that rod, staff, for what a dead man has to offer? Because Satan is a dead man. He's already sentenced to death. Ezekiel 28, verse 18 and 19. Now, uh, to conclude... Turn with me to the great book of Hosea, which means salvation in the Hebrew tongue. Hosea, immediately following the book of Daniel we were in this morning. <clears throat> book of Hosea, we're going to go with chapter 2. Always know that God loves his children. Do you know why he created his children? To give him pleasure. If you give him pleasure, then he's happy. If you don't pleasure him, he's not happy at all. So Hosea, meaning salvation. And um, let's pick it up, if we may, in the 14th verse of this great second uh, chapter. Therefore, and listen carefully, these are words of love from your father. Speaking of the woman that flees into the wilderness, okay? And this is the capstone, and we will complete with this scripture. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I'm going to call her. I'm going to talk to her. I'm going to whisper truth to her. I'm going to feed her knowledge and bring her into the wilderness that is that medbar of pasture, food, and speaking. And speak comfortably unto her. I'm going to tell her what to do. I'm going to be with her. I'm going to give her everything. Hey, listen, what have you got to worry about? What have you got to fear when God loves you to this point? That he says, I'm going to allure you. I'm going to speak with you. I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to take real good care of you. 15, and I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor. Do you know what Achor means in the Hebrew tongue? Trouble. I'm going to give her the valley of trouble for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. There again, I'm going to take care of her. Hey, do you know what happened in the land of Acre, trouble? She went on through. And that's what he's telling you here. Don't ever let a little trouble upset you. You know? You, you, somebody throws a lemon at you. Hey, have a lemonade. Okay? It's good. Good for the soul. You know? In other words, God's going to, you, you got to trust God enough to know that when something like that happens, he has a purpose for it. Why? You're that woman in the wilderness. 
He's got things for you to do. And sometimes when you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer, he's got to kind of nudge you a little bit sometimes, okay? Thank him for it. Kiss the paddle and say, thank you, Lord. And go on and do his work. You know? Because he's going to protect you. He's going to tell you, teach you, and you're going to have the victory, all right? 100%. Uh, even if there is trouble there, bring it on. We can handle it. That's no step for a stepper. 16. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai, and shalt call me no more Bela. Which, do you know what Ishai means? It means husband. It's your husband. Do you know what that means? The wedding's taking place. You're no longer going to call me Lord. You're going to call me husband. Okay? For, for I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by her name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beast of the field and with the fowls of the air and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. Remember where we started back in Isaiah chapter 11 where it said the lamb will lie down with the wolf? Well, you know, a wolf will tear a lamb to pieces, but not here because they're no longer in the flesh. They're no longer carnivores. When we come to this point, we've graduated into that world that is all his and do you know something? You will have had a part in establishing it in as much as you were in his medbar, wilderness of pasture, food, nourishment of truth to defeat Satan and to be able to speak face to face and mouth to mouth a truth that no one can question that no one can argue with because it's the word of God. You can't go wrong that way. He said, there, you're no longer going to call me Yahweh. You're going to call me Isha. You're going to call me husband. Okay? We're speaking in a spiritual sense. It apply, there's no gender. It applies to everyone. 19, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. How long? Forever I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. It doesn't get any better than that. But there's trouble. Who cares? If God is with you to that point, can't you handle a little acor? Hey, do you know what you do with little ants? Stomp them. Okay? Take charge. All right? Be a can do type person. Am I telling you to be evil? No, be gracious, be kind, and don't take nothing off nobody. Okay? You're a child of God. And a child of God doesn't take advantage of anybody. It's fair in everything, but fairness also can rock the other way if somebody tries to take uh, advantage of a person that's being fair. Okay? Is that common sense? That's natural, and that's God's way. Uh, 20. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Why? You be your husband, your family. You're that close, and God loves you. Boy, does He love you. You know, He's really leveling it out right here about the woman in the wilderness and how He loves her. I will allure her, I'll talk kind to her. Okay. That, that's kind of like saying, I will court her, okay, so that you have this spiritual connotation. And it shall come to pass in that day. What day? The day this happens. I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. It's all, it's, it's, we're all going to communicate, okay? Why? Because heaven's going to be right here on earth. Have you ever read uh, Matthew, uh, Revelation 21? And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Now, we're in the book of Hosea, salvation. And God told Hosea to go marry a harlot, okay? And the first, one of the first children said, name him Jezreel. Jezreel in the Hebrew tongue has two meanings. Uh, to scatter 
and to sow. Okay. God said, I'm not going to scatter you anymore. Because he did. He scattered the house of Israel all over the world. He says, and, but to sow means to bring back, to reclaim. And that's why he would use this child's name here. Verse 23, and Jezreel shows because the word is sow. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. To who? To me. That's God speaking. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. That's, I will, that's lu ruhama in the Hebrew and ruhama. Not mercy, but mercy. I'm, I'm going to love her, in other words. And I will say to them, which were not my people, lo ami, not my people. Thou art my people, you art ami, my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. How could you not call him your God? When he makes you promises like that. At that very wilderness. Medbar. You're fed, and you speak, and you bring forth truth, changes the world. Don't ever think, don't ever think for a minute that, that Christians at this time are not making a big difference. I know we are, okay. and, and uh, if you listen closely, it shows. But when I say we are, I'm talking about we that have our habitation in God, and he's doing it, Okay. Give all the praise to God for you're coming into that time where he leads and he utilizes people. He leads people. He guides people. And just as he promised, you're going into the wilderness. You're going to go out there. Satan's going to be on your case. But I'm going to swallow up those lies by feeding you real truth and you're going to scald him. Okay? You're going to take good care of him. Why? Because God is with you. He's always promised that. So why did I bring forth this lecture? Don't ever be afraid. Don't be afraid of being delivered up before this, the, the Antichrist. It's a blessing to have God with you and wanting to speak through you just as he led the children out of Egypt took real good care of them. He's promising you the same thing. Praise him. You don't have a care in the world as far as the victory is concerned because you love him. Don't ever forget that. And no, he's Ishai. He's her husband. He's the, she said, I am going to rule this earth. Not Satan. I'm going to. So, hey, always be on the winning side. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your promises, for your food. Father, thank you for the pasture. Thank you, Father, for leading us, guiding us, directing us, Father. Let each and every one of these, Father, be a blessing to whom they come in contact with, Father, knowing there has been one of your children in their presence, Father. Use them and bless them. We ask it in Yahshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And do you know what that word is in the Greek? It means a language you weren't born with. Why? So that you can go there and teach God's word where the people that speak that tongue can understand it. Now, um, you, uh, to say that uh, you could do nothing in God's name, that's 
that, that somebody's robbing you and somebody is ignorant. Now, probably what they're thinking about is the Pentecostal tongue. Do, do you believe the Bible or do you believe people? That's what it comes down to. Have you ever read Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 of what the Pentecostal tongue actually is? Pentecost means simply 50, okay? It was the 50th day after the crucifixion. No big deal, no secret name, no password. It's just 50 days after the crucifixion. Then Christ told them on the 40th day, you wait until you receive what I'm going to send you, the Holy Spirit. And in verses 6 and 7, it says the mystery was, it wasn't unknown. Just the opposite, and this is the proof of the evidence of the Holy Spirit, every language in the world could understand it because it was in their language. Man can't do that, but the Holy Spirit can. So the true Pentecostal tongue, there's nothing unknown about it, okay? I hope that helps you. Um, R R D R D. Uh, Adrian, okay, Adrian uh, from California. I certainly enjoy studying with you. My question is, how will a true Christian be deceived by the Antichrist? Well, a true Christian will never be deceived by the Antichrist. A true Christian knows that Christ has warned us the Antichrist is coming first and that we are to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us as it is in chapter 13. Now, uh, anyone that doesn't know that, this, why do you think, why do you think, Adrienne, that Jesus was only happy with two of those seven churches? Because they knew, they believed him when, and knew that the synagogue of Satan was going to be set up before Christ's kingdom. And rather than being forewarned, they run into the synagogue of Satan instead of stand against it. So how could you call them, and I know you're not, but I want you to think about it. How could you call someone that would run into the synagogue of Satan a true Christian? I couldn't. Nothing true about them. Uh, most people, many people, unfortunately, listen to um, people that are sluggards. I'm going to use that word, okay, because I just hate to say lazy, okay? God considers a sluggard to be like a hinge on a door, okay? Only he says it's to a mattress. That's a proverb, okay? They just flip from one side to the other. He said, that's what I think of lazy people. You've got to get into God's word. Don't, don't be lazy and expect someone to spoon feed you without checking them out. All right to study with someone. But don't you ever dare be lazy and not check them out. This man or any other person that's teaching, you make their work stand up. And if it doesn't stand up on its own, it'll fall. Okay, But you check it out for yourself or you will fall because you'll you're, you possibly would listen to some what? Jerry from Minnesota. We have learned more from you and in the word than we ever did 50 years before. Well, well, thank you. That's quite a compliment. If I remember right, you said Satan's job was to guard the mercy seat, but I find the lid of the ark to be the mercy seat, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, and Leviticus. Was there more than one mercy seat? Now, it's talking about, uh, Jerry, the one in the first earth age, okay? And you'll read of it in, in Ezekiel chapter 28 when he was the cherub that protecteth, okay? The one we had in Exodus and in Leviticus was only a copy. It's one Moses made, but it, it looked like the original, okay? But it wasn't the original that Satan fell from. Sherry from Minnesota. I think this is the second one we've had from Sherry today. My question is, if Noah had to bring two of every flesh on board, did that mean he had to also bring two of the Nephilim? No. Nephilim were not flesh. Okay. Nephilim comes from the prime root in the Hebrew, napha, 
Nephilim. Napha means fallen, fallen angels. They were not flesh. Though they were able to impregnate woman. Why? Because man is made in the exact image. That means exact, exact likeness of God and the angels. And naturally, if Adam was, then they were able to impregnate. Why? Because even angels' food, manna, sustains the angel body. It also does a flesh body. So you have that exact copy, only one's flesh, one isn't. Okay, Flesh is very perishable, but the angelic body doesn't age. Okay, uh, This corruptible, meaning one that ages and get sick, must put on incorruption. It's talking about bodies, not souls. Uh, Bobby from Indiana. What scriptures do I read to learn about where the Israelites were after Jerusalem was destroyed in 71 AD? The Israelites went into captivity 600 years before, uh, 671 years before uh, 71 AD, okay? It was all over. By that time, the, the house of Judah went into captivity about 400 uh, B.C. So with Israel going 600 B.C., Judah 400 B.C., then a few came back, but half of them were Nethanim, meaning um, people doing liturgical duty, claiming to be preachers, but not. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all. Know why? You enjoy God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Brought to you by tithes and offerings. If we helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? But most important, this is what you do. You stay in our Father's Word every day, in His Word, even with trouble. Still a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yahshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.